relevant to today's youth. Um, to start the debate, we have Joe Bates. Joe is a first year music, music student at Keys. Um, he's a classical music editor for the TAB, and as a composer, has been broadcast on Radio 3. So, Joe, thank you very much. strange man with a massive beard that comes to every classical event. <laughs> <laughs> and instead, I uh, found out three weeks ago that I would be debating with Kissy Sellout against Stephen Fry to a packed chamber and now to thousands more people across the world on the internet, which makes my task rather much more terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to do my best. Um, and part of what I'm going to do to do my best is not really take them head on, because what I want to talk about tonight is new music, right? new classical music, and its place um, in culture, or rather, what I believe is its lack of a place. Um, but first I want to start with a bit of history, because I don't think that classical music is just irrelevant now. Because classical music, for most of history, has been irrelevant to most of people most of the time. Because like, history tells us that you know, in the 18th century everyone sat around in white powdered wigs listening to Haydn's string quartets. But that's because history is written by the winners, and the winners of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century were a small moneyed elite who controlled who listened to what. And so as a result, we have this massively kind of skewed vision of what people used to listen to in the past. And the true story of Western classical music is a story of popular music, of folk music, as it was rather patronizingly called before the 20th century. And so what I'm gonna be talking about today is the balance between those two forces and why classical music must have lost the battle by now. So what has defined classical music all along is its exclusivity. Classical music has always been what is not folk music and, and has um, kind of forged itself through reference to its own tradition. So to be a classical composer, what you're doing is you're saying, I am composing in reference to this closed set of people, rather than everything else that everybody else listens to. Um, kind of ironically, it does, um, to justify this, it claims universality. It claims, oh, well, classical music is this kind of objectively good thing. And if you don't like it, it's your fault, because you don't know enough. And um, I mean, I, I think that's rubbish, and I think that it's, um, about time that people begin to look at it in that way. Um, and so what we, then you reach the 20th century and things begin to change. And the story of the 20th century is really one of the greatest like, unsung stories of cultural shifts ever. It's the complete obsolescence of an entire genre of art. 20, um, classical music goes from being kind of the predominant cultural form uh, in cultural discourse to something that's barely talked about anymore, it, particularly in terms of new composition. And instead, what you have is the story of the triumph of popular music. And there, there are several um, reasons for that, and the first of them is technological. Because in the 19th century, if you wanted to put on a concert, you had to have loads of money. In the 18th century, you had big, found, um, big funders like the Esterhazys, who um, allowed Haydn to do whatever he wanted with his orchestras. In the 19th century, they relied on a small group of petty bourgeoisie who were able to pay extortionate ticket prices, but exclude the vast majority of peasants who they didn't really care about anyway. <laughs> in the 1920s, things began to change. You got recording, you got radio. Suddenly people were able to listen to things that previously they weren't allowed to listen to. And so, and so suddenly you get everybody being able to make music. Moreover, like the barrier that you have of getting your group loud enough that people can hear you is broken down um, by amplification. Because you know, in the 19th century, if you want people to hear you, you want to have a really big effect, you've got to have a big orchestra, because otherwise it's just not that exciting. But then when amplification comes, it, in a kind of beautiful historical pun, amplifies the reach of popular music and allows it, um, sorry, I was a bit cheap, <laughs> allows it um, to, to get to places that it never has before. And then this is all backed up by the huge class changes that we have in the 20th century. So firstly, there's changes in what's acceptable to listen to. Like, if you're um, a posh middle class lad like me, in the 19th century, you wouldn't be allowed to go down um, to the local pub and listen so folk music, that's something, something that would have been completely culturally unacceptable and deemed totally bizarre by everyone. Whereas when you reach the 20s, suddenly that begins to change. And it's brilliant, you, you get this massive breakdown uh, in those kind of barriers, in the class barriers that have previously entirely defined the way that people listen to music. 
So in the 20s, you get people listening to jazz and then to rock and roll, um, and eventually to um, mainstream popular music um, as a group. But also, what you get is you get a furthering of education. So you get intellectual people that aren't posh, which, um, which really changed the face of music because you got people who began to do interesting things and in changing the way that folk music works. So it no longer became a kind of an isolated, non-progressive thing. It became something that was really dynamic, that was really exciting, and that was at the forefront um, of artistic endeavor. And so what you do is you, you find that in the, um, in the 20th century, <coughs> classical music begins to lose. <coughs> Firstly, it loses its vast economic dominance that has allowed it to trample all other types of music. But secondly, it loses its core constituency. It loses its constituency of interested people, of interesting people, because they are no longer forced to listen to um, things dictated entirely by their clubs. So this is particularly important in the sphere of new music, because what happens in the 20th century is when new music begins to be abandoned by the masses, it begins to abandon the masses. What you find is an increasing retreat to this idea of universality. You, get, you find um, composers in the um, 1940s and 50s and 60s saying, well, look, you're not listening to me, but it doesn't matter because what I'm writing is objectively good. Look, there's all this maths in it. That means it's really clever and really good, and it's your fault for not understanding it. Classical music retreats and, and, and retreats into its, in, its institutions. Um, now, I'm giving here quite a partial story, I will confess. Like, in the 1970s in particular, you begin um, kind of the postmodern revolution of classical music where you have all kinds of composers who begin to fight against this. But what I would really argue is that the entire concept that they're buying into by calling themselves classical composers is entirely obsolete. Because the whole point of classical music is that it is, it is what it is not. It is not in reference to everything else. And so that whenever, you know, uh, to name, name drop some modern composers, whenever your Thomas Hades is or your Mark Anthony Turnages include um, rock music, whenever they include uh, jazz, they do so in, frankly, rather patronising inverted commas. And they may be producing great music, but the point is, is that they're not producing music which is anything to do with the culture that they're in. They're producing music which is deliberately not the culture that it is in, because that is the entire premise of classical music. So when I come to classical music as a creator, as a composer, I'm faced with this dilemma. Do I write in reference to the world around me? Do I write in reference to the, to the music that I've grown up absorbing and loving? Do I write you know, in reference to Radiohead as well as Beethoven? Or do I say, well, no, actually, all that's important is that I follow this long tradition, that I say that old, rich German men from, 19, from 1800 are more important than everyone else in the world put together. <laughs> and frankly, that's right. I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. I think that there really is no defensible future for calling yourself a classical composer. Because by doing so, what you're saying is everything else is irrelevant. All that is relevant is this long historical teleological tradition and my isolation and my purity. And I think that that is a load of rubbish. So I think that what we'll begin to find is that classical music will begin to die. And people and composers of my age are beginning to realise this and as a result not call themselves composers. And uh, that's uh, another very loaded term. Um, cl new classical music is basically now irrelevant. People don't listen to it and that's because it excludes the music that everyone does listen to. Once it, it, it loses its exclusive camp, once it stops calling itself classical music and just lets itself be music, then it will become clear to everyone that the death of classical music isn't something that people who are interested in music and interested in intellectual music should mourn, but something that we should celebrate. I beg to propose. This is for two reasons. 
Firstly, for admitting on Radio 4 this morning that he was terrified by the prospect of defending this emotion. And secondly, the brilliance of bringing a pair of debts and debts to the, uh, to the Union Chamber. <laughs> I've told Lauren and Frankie both that this society has been failing because of its lack of mixing in debates. <laughs> in fact, the tradition would be much enhanced if it was, so Kissy, thank you very much. <laughs> the idea that classical music, the body itself, some concept, is relevant to today's youth is absurd. Equally, so is the idea that the concept of democracy is, or, or the abstract notion of personal development. In all these cases, what is relevant isn't some lofty concept. Rather, it's the actions that go with that concept. With classical music, this is two such actions, listening and performing. We ought to take these two separately, as they show in different ways why classical music is still relevant. The idea that listening to classical music is irrelevant seems to gain most of its support from falling numbers of young people listening to it. Whilst, prima facie, this does support the idea it's relevant to Sweeney, it's far from clear when we think about it that this is the case. Young people, admittedly, might not be paying for the seats and concerts, nor are they crowding around the radio to listen to BBC Three. They are, however, surrounded by classical music and its, uh, and its role in other art forms. The works of Mozart alone featuring such recent cultural highlights as Face Off, Charlie's Angels, and The Truman Show. <laughs> Countless adverts selling your favourite products across the world tempt you with classical music. The, the song that sends shivers down the spines of football fans all around the world was, surprisingly, not composed by the UEFA Champions League, but by Handel. <laughs> These examples serve to show that any claims that young people don't listen to music, classical music are blinkered and narrow-minded. Further, they go to show that, at least in the most general sense of the term, classical music is relevant to young people in that it's connected to them. It reverberates from our TV screens, our radios, and at the very least has provided the background music to our, most of our lives. How can we say that we don't go a day without hearing some classical music, whether it's when you walk into a shopping centre, stand in an elevator, or in call-in waiting? It's there. On this point alone, the motion fails, but we can do a lot better. We might demand that relevance implies something strong, but in some sense it means that classical music is pertinent, appropriate, or fitting in some way to young people. In an obvious sense, classical music is of course still relevant, in the same way that Greek tragedy is still relevant, Shakespearean drama is still relevant, and, and modernist fiction is still relevant. What classical music is about doesn't change depending on your culture or your time. Rather, it covers enduring issues and themes. Vivaldi's hopeful spring isn't only applying to springs pre-19th century. Similarly, Vaughan Williams' melancholic reflection on, law, or on war isn't just about the First World War. Now, with these last two points, I have to check myself. There's always a worry, as was expressed by Joe, with classical music, that the arguments that you hear are only one raise of the opera glasses away from condescending and moralistic. And these types of arguments have been the main barrier to the appreciation participation in classical music over recent years. Too often, far too often, we hear people saying, if only young people would absorb some technical information, follow the experts and note some formal structures, then they would come to see that music is not only good, but great. Similarly, we hear extravagantly high-minded praise of the excellence of composers, closely followed by some sort of claim that the best people listen to the best kind of music. These kinds of arguments on top of being authoritarian and pompous, only serve to make appreciation of classical music appear unattainable. In fact, if either of those arguments were necessary, I would be sitting on the other side of the debate tonight. The reality is so much simpler. Listening to music is valuable because it's enjoyable and because it's engaging. It offers, like so much other art, an escape from life's burdens and a focus on your emotions and on some, something beautiful. It simultaneously hones our attention away from some things and towards others. As I say, lots of art does this, but classical music has a special place. The complexity and subtlety of classical music means that when we listen, we have to really listen. From my own experience, at least, classical music is much harder work than other ones that I've tried. It takes concentration and it takes some patience to enjoy it. Now for today's youth, living in a world that moves at a digital speed, a world with increasingly many people, ideas and agendas, agendas. Surrounded by technological change, 
environmental worries, and cultural conflicts. What could possibly be more pertinent than a hobby that encourages and develops the ability to think deeply? A hobby which invites people to do a bit of self-reflection, and a hobby which encourages you to spend some time appreciating the work of others. It is, as I say, pretty hard to imagine a more pertinent hobby. Hard, sure, but not impossible. There is one, maybe, that I think that could be more relevant. That's the participation in classical music, and that's where I want to spend the rest of my speech. Whatever our conception of today's youth is, whether it's the Daily Mail's idea of an asbo-ridden, disrespectful, hooded scumbag, <laughs> or it's the idea of a generation that no longer speaks to each other in person, merely send Facebook messages, or tweets, Stephen. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, we shouldn't limit our understanding to British boundaries. And this is because there's an example that serves perfectly to show how participation in classical music can be hugely relevant to young people. And that example comes from Venezuela. Again, I hesitate at this point. There's an unwritten rule in this chamber that starting any argument with one of Hugo Chavez's policies <laughs> has tended to be a recipe for failure. This time, I think, guys, we're on to a winner, so don't worry about it. El Sistema is a youth project which started in Venezuela but is now going global. Originally called Social Action for Music, the entire programme has been managed out of the Venezuelan Social Service Ministry not the Department for Culture. And it must surely rank as one of the most important and fascinating social phenomena of our time. Founded on the belief that every poverty-stricken child should have access to free music, the programme sets out to show that young people's lives can be radically transformed by music. Since its foundation in 1975, despite decades of political instability, the programme has grown beyond belief. Every obstacle in its pathway has been swept aside, and currently 300,000 Venezuelan children are involved in the scheme at any one time, and many claim it has saved them from a life of delinquency and of crime. The symphony orchestra's inherent emphasis on non-competitive teamwork has meant it has served as an absolute equaliser in the societies with deep and troubling fractions. Its success has pushed it onto a global scale. In Portugal, New Zealand, in Scotland, and indeed here in England, copycat schemes have started. In Harmony, the English scheme is transforming lives in impoverished communities in Lambeth, Norwich, and Liverpool. In those areas, schools are already reporting improved concentration, attendance, and behaviour thanks to the scheme. So just over an hour away from this very chamber, children are flourishing in the Lambeth scheme, with a recent performance evaluation highlighting two things. One, how well the, co the programme is combating social exclusion, and two, how it's substantially increasing the happiness of children. The other pilot schemes have shown similar results and are recommending expansion of the project. Indeed, if this government has any conviction behind what it says about social mo mobility, or indeed if the fabled big, so big society is to materialise at some point, then these are the exact kind of schemes that need to go nationwide sooner rather than later. Children for whom the closest thing to music is a slamming door are being given an opportunity that encourages teamwork, confidence and dedication. It is not just that classical music is so clearly relevant to the youth of today, rather that a strong belief and willingness to promote it could do so much more. And it's on this thought that I'd like to hold it. I think most of the motivation that we've heard already, and I imagine will continue to hear, for thinking classical music has become irrelevant is based on either blinkered or misconceived views about what classical music is. This motivation is not unfounded. There are far too many advocates of classical music out there who proclaim the benefits in a disgustingly condescending and alienating way. In order to see its relevance, we have to open our eyes a little, note its role in other art forms as a tool for excitement rather than stress. Finally, if we are unconvinced by the role listening to music might have for our youth, the El Sistema project and its global counterpoints Global counterparts are showing the world that participation is as relevant as it has been, uh, as relevant as ever. More than just rewarding on an individual level, it is a vehicle for radical and lasting social change. So, from the child playing the piano out of, out of the cycle of poverty in Venezuela to the football fan roaring along to handle in the Champions League final, for those few minutes in which we, in which we escape the humdrum of every day and engage in something beautiful, classical music is not just relevant to today's youth is pervasive, important and inspiring.
For those reasons, I beg you to oppose the motion. Simple. I recorded this yesterday. 
the third movement of the symphony, number five, by the former master of the king's music, William Boyce, played on Classic FM by the Academy of Ancient Music, conducted by Christopher Hogwood. <laughs> John Suchet there from uh, Classic Affair, that was yesterday, I just turned that on. Uh, that was uh, playing the, um, the third, uh, third movement of the fifth uh, s symphony of uh, the <laughs> Academy of uh, the Ho Hogwarts School. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, you see what I mean? Uh, I think my, my point I'm getting at, really, um, is that classical music uh, is detached from the modern language of popular culture. Um, and I guess, you know, since the significance of things like image in uh, music, images, you know, visual you know, uh, images in music has diminished so much over the uh, last few years, especially because of things like the internet and stuff like that. As an example of this, I've got, I stole this off my mum. This is, uh, this is uh, Bruce Springsteen, yeah, it's the, it's like, you know, <laughs> this is, uh, it's the vinyl. For anyone that's under a certain name, this is records, it's, it's, <laughs> it's with CD. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, um, right, yeah, so this came out, if you went to a record store in 1980, when I was born, 1984, uh, you could see that on your, on your, on your record store thing. I, got, um, I, I, bought, I bought that yesterday, actually, on iTunes, and, um, and, uh, and there it is. That's the, you probably can't see, it's quite small, but the, the, the image is there, the text is a bit bigger than the image, but, but it's there, it's, it's there anyway. Um, so you can kind of, you can kind of see uh, how uh, important the, the language aspect, the descriptions are, are, are so, uh, you know, so important for classical music or music in general, especially in a world where young people want to, um, you know, they've always wanted, they've always wanted everything at once. I, I definitely did when I was a kid. I wanted ice cream at once. I wanted TV at once. I wanted, I wanted pillow fights at once. I wanted everything at once. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted girls at once. I had to wait for ages. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Uh, on, from the arrival of uh, the internet, of course, it revolutionised everything. For the first, first time, they could have everything they wanted. But what it meant was that that immediacy, that immediacy of yearning, stuff has to be immediately like accessible. You have to just be able to understand what it is and know what it is and, and pick it out from the shelf. Um, I can think. It's lovely, right? It's just right. Um, so, in this rapidly accelerating, multicolored, uh, 3D future, uh, it's not hard to see why the perceived value of music uh, has plummeted. And therefore, classical music needs more than ever to resonate with uh, perhaps other aspects of life. Because uh, we've failed on the language thing. Sorry, Kiko, it's happened. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's not too much to ask, I don't think. The, in, you know, when you, at a time of youth, that, that potency of, uh, of that, like, that basic human needs to like, fit in. You, know, you, you, you want to feel like you belong somewhere. You want to meet friends. You want to be part of something. You know? I, I think that's one of the... Um, it's, yeah, well, it's stronger, it's stronger than ever at that, at that time. And many, in history, many musical genres have, have kind of provided that. A lot of them have done. And, and, and not just that. They've been relevant in terms of social and political change, you know. Uh, people can define their personalities by music. I certainly did when I was younger. I was a bit of a misfit. Uh, now look at me now, I'm still a misfit. Uh, but the, uh, <laughs> the, if you look at the, you know, let's pick out a few genres. If you think about things like punk music, uh, punk rock. You like punk rock, so you don't mind if I do this to you. First time, I didn't realise it was all kind of going to be a child. Uh, punk rock, uh, grunge music. When I was a kid, I used to talk a lot of Nirvana uh, records. I used to love that stuff, man. I, was, uh, I used to love being depressed and stuff. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get things like um, UK Garage, which, if you think about it, um, was the first time, really, and uh, significantly, that uh, it was a huge step forward for British urban culture, black culture, crossing over into the mainstream. We got to the charts, and we took up the charts, took up the nightclubs. It was absolutely funny. Um, sorry, just excuse me. Um, anyway, sadly, um, the reason for this is that classical music is an elitist uh, form of artistic expression, and it always has been. Uh, it's actually even shocked me. Uh, it's something that's come from the higher classes, it's aimed at the higher classes. Uh, it was originally funded by royalty and, and, and wealthy patrons who didn't have televisions uh, and needed to watch something with their, their, their family and paid friends and servants and stuff. Um, <laughs> Can young people relate to that? Well, um, I, here we go. Let's do, let's do a little comparison here, okay? The, uh, on, the, on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day, yeah, let's get this right, yes, absolutely wonderful. On uh, Christmas Day, uh, 5.6 million people listened to this. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. 
5.6 million people just, uh, watch that. On the same day, on the same channel, on the same day, same channel, BBC One, 10 point, hang on, let me, it's a lot, 10.9 million people. Watch this. So, do you want to say a prayer or something? Um, dear God, amen. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> Real life, that is. That's real life. Yeah. I tell you. Um, at this point, I must say, um, it's. Uh, do you, does anyone want to hear a remix of the Queen's speech? Just, just, just throwing it out there. I'll, 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 I'll tease you with it. Ready? and it can be a performance in front of lots of trendy and cool people. Uh, can, I'm going to try and get your man, Stevie Fry, over now, uh, to help me out. We're going to do a DJ set, big time. It's going to be like... <laughs>
to make sense of. When I was invited to take part, I thought, yes, I can root for classical music. But then I took a closer look at the motion. I thought, oh my god, can I really? Can I really? This house proposes that classical music is not relevant to today's young people. I thought, I can't make sense of it. It's, it was described this morning by my learned colleague, Stephen Fry, as a no-brainer emotion, by which I suppose he meant that it's, it's a kind of knockout, one can dismiss it as a knockout, but I think actually the case is worse than that. I think it is a literal no brainer in the sense that it's got no discernible intellectual content at all. As far as I know. The way to start with it, one of my previous speakers has already pointed to the word relevant, which is, let's face it, one of those awful boo words that some certain kind of philosophers um, and cultural critics use to frighten you off a certain area of cultural endeavour. It's, it's, it's an empty word. I mean, what is relevant to oneself at any given time? If I'm hungry, the ham sandwich on the plate is very relevant. If I just have a meal, it's not. Is the model from architecture of Bounalesky's dome at the Florence Dwarf Is that relevant to me? Who's to say? If I'm interested in that kind of thing, then it is. If I'm not, then it isn't. Uh, it's, it's, once you venture into dis discussions of the word relevance, you ask, you ask to whom, at what point, for what purpose, you enter into a sort of morass from which there's no escape. So I think I'll leave that one aside for now, but I'm going to come back to it a little later, because I think there is something hiding. There is something hiding in this motion. It, it makes it more interesting than it appears to be. Although it is sort of, in a way, intellectually empty, there's something fishy about it. I think it smells bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's dodgy. And I, I'd like to come back later and try and explain what I think the dodginess of it is. Um, but first, I'm going to try and get into the motion itself. Uh, Relevance can't do it. Let's try the other bit of it. Today's youth. Well, what a curious notion. It suggests that today's youth is somehow different to yesterday's or the day before. Um, it suggests to me that youth is a some kind of curious tribe. <laughs> it's not part of the human race at all. <laughs> some, I, mean, I mean, here you are. I mean, you are uh, surrounded by them, but mostly. Um, <laughs> it's sort of normal to me. You know, you've got the usual complement of arms and legs. You know, I can probably hold a conversation with you. But no, the motion says, you're a funny tribe. And you have your own special needs, your own special art lot your own special way of doing things, which may be true enough, but, you know, I have a suspicion that maybe underneath all that, we might be all one human race. Isn't that a, isn't that a revolutionary idea? But just to pursue that, I thought, well, I'd better find out a bit more about youth, given that it's some way behind me now, <laughs> quite as young as I was. I thought, how can I find out about today's youth? Am I going to do field work? You know, I'm going to put my pith helmet on and take Packs my own rations and go out to the urban jungle and find them in their legs. Oh, no, that's too dangerous. <laughs> I, know, I know what I'll do. I'll listen to Kissy's show. Because Kissy's show is directed at youth. 
I'll just listen to the show. It'll be great. And so, I, just a few days ago, thanks to BBC iClaire, <laughs> tuned in. And um, I'm hoping my telephone is going away. This is what I heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you ready for this, those, those of you who are not so good? Here we go. It's coming. The following totally extraordinary radio show may be a little scary for some of you out there. Perhaps it is time to put the parents to bed and turn up your own sound system wherever you are right now. Hello there, young rave. Oh, what's oh. <laughs> Put the parents to bed, that's me. You know, I thought I'd better put my, my daughter's a little young for me today, so I thought I'll put myself to bed. You know, so I, I did as I was told, you know, I put my night shirt on, <laughs> blew up the cocoa, put my bed socks on, toss them off to bed, you know, safely. And uh, in search, and hoping that I would find that song, you know, that particular song that would give me the zeitgeist, that would tell me what young people are all about today. And it, I, was, I, I struck lucky. The first time I heard it was really good. A song. Fake Freaks, it's called. Here it is. turned into a magical some hundreds of years ago. Clear, bright eyes. You set me on fire. I think I know what the problem is. Did somebody say it? You set me on fire. Yeah, same, we're in the same territory, aren't we? <laughs> you set me on fire, you do, but my heart feels pleasure, not pain. This is where it gets interesting. In the flames, dear sweet words, you pierce me, you do. But my breast feels not pain, but delight in the wound. Well, this, is, well, this is curious, isn't it? It's the pain that gives pleasure. And this is, where, this is where it starts to get really interesting, because we get into some really deep, strange region of emotional ambiguity, which I think we all, we all know what he's talking about, don't we? I mean, that's, that's not arcane. That's not kind of arty-farty nonsense. 
that this is something real. And this is what um, a certain great composer called Monteverdi did with it. Subservience and civility towards modern bourgeois culture. It's pretty tough, isn't it? Now, what was he talking about? He was talking about this. <laughs> Uh, um, a certain kind of music is irrelevant because 
uh, some ideologue says it really ought to be, and for that reason, oppose the remain.
you can look at it, whether it's sort of Don McLean's American Pie or my Get a sense of my choice, not everyone's. But <laughs> get a sense of what society was like at that point in time. And I think that's a really interesting, important aspect of it. Yes, classical music has something great about it that is quite timeless, but I personally prefer the fact that you can look at music over the past 50 years and actually really get a sense of what things were like at that stage in history. Yeah. States and brought here for this event, which two weeks ago I knew nothing about. <laughs> Thrilled to be here, landed at six o'clock this morning, and I love my team. <laughs> <laughs> and one reason I love them is that they embody creativity. I asked Joe before the debate what music inspired him, and I got a list of impressive people in pop music. The name I knew was Radiohead. I'm sure the others are equally impressive. Kissing is a living fountain of creativity. I have been teaching in American music schools for 15 years. I teach at Juilliard, the biggest and most important of them. And there's no creativity going on. And if the musicians studying the cello or the clarinet said that they were inspired by Radiohead or that they wanted to create their own remixes, they would be told not to do it. And I'm afraid, Hugo, that Elsie Stenner is a serious offender here because they do not teach composition. People there are simply told to obey the rules and play the notes on the page. And the amount of compositional energy that might be with those kids who are inspired by music is not even allowed to flower. And I must say to my colleague, the music critic, anybody can prove any genre of music is better than any other simply by loading the dice and picking the right comparisons. <laughs> if I picked one of the weaker moments of one of Massenet's weak operas, <laughs> and I compared it to Bring the Noise from Public Enemy, you would only be convinced that hip hop was great art and classical music was crap. <laughs> <laughs> and now. <laughs> now to the prepared part of my remarks. I think when we talk about the relevance of classical music to young people, three ideas have been hammered together that in fact are distinct. One is, is classical music in fact interesting to younger people on the whole? Could it be? And then possibly, <coughs> should it be? So I propose to unpack these and consider them one at a time. Is classical music in fact relevant or interesting to younger people? Well. Studies were done in past decades in the United States about the classical music audience, and it turned out to be very young. It turned out to have a median age of 35, which means half of it was younger, which means that classical music was extremely relevant to young people there. Then they went, they enjoyed it, they studied it, and then you know what happened? As the years went on after the late 60s, the audience got older and older and older and older. And younger people, as we say in America, voted with their feet against classical music. And nobody can deny that. Now, I teach in music schools, and I can tell you 
if there are younger people who study classical music and do it professionally, they, on the other hand, tell me that none of their friends are interested. Their friends will not even come to their concerts. And if they happen to do it, they certainly don't go to other classical concerts <laughs> on their own. Um, there is a revolt which musicologists tell me about. If an American university requires the study of classical music as part of a required humanities course, the students rise up in revolt and say they don't want to learn it. I have heard from piano teachers in small towns that their classical students practice classical pieces with clenched teeth and no interest and no creativity. I don't think younger people are very interested. Now, could they be? Could they be? Well, yes, of course they could be. Classical music is an important part of Western culture. It's an important part of our history. In a proper, balanced cultural diet, of old and new things, Western and non-Western things, of course classical music should play a part. But there are special obstacles for not just younger people, but older people too, in appreciating and being interested in classical music. And the basic one is, as gentlemen on my team have already said in their different ways, that classical music has drifted away from the mainstream of our culture, certainly in the United States. And the aging of the audience year by year, from around 1968 onward, gives you an almost annual measurement of that drift. Uh, the core of the audience is now essentially people who came to it when younger people still were interested. And they're not being joined by very many others. Classical music so clearly as it's practiced now, it doesn't have to be the case, but it is, it does not represent or reflect or embody the racial, ethnic, cultural diversity of our world. Absolutely, it does not. And in the content of the mainstream classical works that form the bulk of the repertoire, it does not reflect or embody the gender equality that we would like to take for granted, although I know we cannot as yet. It's all because classical music is focused so entirely despite the presence of new composers to repertoire from the past, we have a vital and diverse contemporary culture. I must say, I have worked professionally in pop music. I have worked in classical music professionally. There is no doubt to me that pop music is by far the more creative field. When you are a pop musician and you, say you decide to do something in music, you do it your own way. If, like Bjork, you want to make pop songs that sound like contemporary classical music, well, go and do it. People may think you're crazy. You sell millions of records. If, like Lou Reed, you want to re release metal machine music, a double LP set in the 70s and nothing but horrible electronic noise, you do it. If, like Josephine Foster, an American folk singer, you want to release an album of German leader accompanying yourself on the guitar, <coughs> singing in German and overlaying the whole thing with electronic noise, you do it. <laughs> classical music is not really in touch with that those impulses or so many others that we take for granted today. And especially, you know, in pop music in the United States, where the struggle for racial equality and for African American voices to be heard in our culture, probably one of the most important events of the 20th century, totally reflected in pop music in its content, in its, particip in its participants, and in the way the business was run. Classical music was an outsider to that an outsider to that, and if anything, stood in the way by maintaining the obstacles to African Americans when other sectors in life had lowered them. So, classical music is not a contemporary art. If you go to the theater, of course there are Shakespeare plays, and of course there are Chekhov plays, but largely there are Tom Stoppard plays, and there are Edward Albee plays, and there are Tony Kushner plays, and you expect the balance focus more towards contemporary work, and we do not have that in classical music. And so, of course, not just younger people are not terribly responsive to it, but older people. My wife, in her mid-40s, classical music critic of the Washington Post, she can't get her college roommates to go to classical concerts. The problem is more than young people. Now, two objections that might be raised, I'll only say one of them, and it is the Elsie Stable book. You know, which I take seriously. Many people think Elsie Stemma is wonderful. 
Elsie's Dilemma is a social program in which large amounts of resources were lavished on teaching kids classical music. And I said, it's great, it's wonderful. And if you go to people who have very little and you give them something nice, of course they respond. I believe they would have responded had it been jazz, had it been entrepreneurship, had it been technology, or as has happened in New York City public schools in poor neighborhoods, if it had been chess. Um, so, where was I? Should classical music be relevant? Oh, and you know what? If we are going to fall at the knees on our knees before Elsie Stemma, we should fall on our knees three times before hip hop, because here you have the American equivalent of those Venezuelan kids doing it for themselves, inventing their own kind of music, and turning it into finally a multi billion dollar business. They had to learn how to do new things in music and in business. Now, should we, should classical music be relevant? Many people talk about special values that classical music allegedly imparts. I say the Nazis were fine with classical music and a very telling American example, the first black player in Major League Baseball, 1947. The first black singer at the Metropolitan Opera, <coughs> 1955, same city. The Opera House had been refused when asked previously to take steps in that direction. Why should young people be asked to devote themselves to something whose cultural position is so not contemporary? And why are we insisting that they learn classical music? Why are we even debating this? Why are we not asking why young people are not interested in abstract expressionist painting, the plays of Samuel Beckett, or the films of Truffaut and Godard, or in Islamic art, or in the history of the music they already love? Why in America should not we be teaching jazz and blues, very important American art forms. I have two answers for that, and then, Madam Timekeeper, I will be finished. The first <laughs> answer is many people, and I count myself among them, love classical music dearly, and its decline in America, now symbolized by the bankruptcy of the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, hurts people very deeply. They feel that they're losing something they love. But I think that the other part is a sense of entitlement, a sense of privilege and entitlement that goes with classical music, the feeling that it must survive no matter what. And I will end by saying that that feeling is the greatest obstacle to classical music's surviving because it prevents us in classical music from simply approaching the rest of the world, including young people, as equals so they have very little chance to find us relevant. Thank you. Assignation this evening with an ex-Juilliard student by the name of Lady Gaga. <laughs> I am, I promise you it's true, meeting her this evening. I happen to be rather an admirer 
and Gaga. I think she's rather splendid, and I think she's one of the best things Juilliard has produced for many a long year. <laughs> there's a story, there's a film, one of my favourite films, made by the late, very late, uh, uh, lamented, uh, great cinema director, Sidney Lumet, um, about a boy, actually, who ended up going to Juilliard, funnily enough. It starred uh, River Phoenix. It's a, it's a film called Running on Empty. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's really rather, rather excellent. Uh, he plays a, a boy who's a very talented keyboard player, um, but his family are on the run from the FBI because of a crime they committed many years ago. They have to keep reinventing themselves. And you see him dyeing his hair and going to a new school and pretending to be somebody else. And he arrives uh, at, at this school uh, as, as a student, and he sits in the, in the music class, having arrived late. And the, and the music teacher plays a couple of pieces of music. He plays a piece of dance music, a piece of Madonna, and then he plays a, a, a Beethoven quartet. And he says to the class, can anybody tell me the difference between these pieces of music? One rather cheesy kid, thinking he's going to please the music teacher, says, well, one's good and one's not good. And the teacher says, well, surely that's a matter of opinion. And River Phoenix, very shyly, whom we know is a musical genius, he shyly raises his hand and says, you can't dance to Beethoven. It's a brilliant answer. I love the idea of dance. It so happens my legs were not equipped ever to be able to do it. <laughs> but I love the idea of people going to clubs and having a good time. This motion is not about clubs being a bad idea. This motion is not about dance music being bad. This music is not an I about the idea that classical music is superior to any other kind of music. It celebrates the fact that there is difference that you can love two different things at once and not explode or be a hypocrite. <laughs> Surely if education in a university is about anything, it is about the fact that we can accept and absorb all kinds of ideas and celebrate and love all kinds of modes of human expression. You can make anything sound pretentious only if you are yourself pretentious. You can read a scientific paper and go, ha, 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 I don't understand the words of that. Well, of course you don't, because you're not a scientist. Does that mean it isn't relevant to you or relevant to young people? That paper may well save your grandmother's life one day. The idea that you don't understand where music comes from or that you think classical music happens to be the province of dusty, white-wigged old farts is nothing to do with what the music is. It's a misapprehension on your part. It's a failure of imagination. And worse than that, it's snobbery. It's rank snobbery. You think you're better than that because you're young and you're cool. Well, I've never heard more snobbery in music than amongst young people's music. You know what it's like when you're 14 and you dare to have a party and you put music on and a 15-year-old comes up and goes, <laughs> you call that music? What shit is this? Oh, God! And they point, and you think the band that you thought was cool, they pointed out, isn't cool. That's where the real snobbery in music lies. That's where the terror lies for people, in thinking they have to conform to some idea of what is or what isn't right. And if this university, this astonishing establishment, stands for anything, it stands for freedom of thought, and it stands surely for some kind of imagination and respect and, above <coughs> all, artistic curiosity. No one has more contempt than I do for the fusty, dusty, snobby, repulsive world of classical music as it is often portrayed and as it is often experienced. We've all seen girls with long hair and long dresses weepingly playing the cello to audiences of stultified teenagers who've been dragged along by middle-class parents who think they're somehow enjoying themselves. <laughs> My experience of classical music is nothing to do with, with kings and princes and, and archdukes who have uh, patronised smart, clever, brilliant young composers who themselves are rather poncy. It's about a personal relationship with some of the most extraordinary people who have ever trodden this planet. Take the example solely of Beethoven. Ludwig van Beethoven was not a snob. Ludwig van Beethoven was one of the greatest <coughs> enemies of tyranny <coughs> who ever lived. He himself sparked, he himself ignited and, and consumed the fire that, that lit much of the romantic and later 
uh, mid-19th century revolutionary movement. Mozart, fancy, fancy Mozart, died in a pauper's grave. These people were not samples and examples of what is purely and only for the elite. They were simply people who had something to say, and they wanted to say it to you. And all it requires is that you listen. You actually listen. Dancing is a magnificent communal way of enjoying yourselves together for the purposes of getting off your tits and having sex. <laughs> in the world and I have seen that to be true in all kinds of cultures and it has been so and will always be so. That is why humans dance. Listening to music is quite another thing. Quite another thing. Another hero of mine, simply because of his greatness of spirit, is another one you might consider to be simply a powdered wig and that was Georg Friedrich Händel, known to us of course as Handel. Handel was a rather preposterous figure in many ways. He, he ate very noisily and left most of his food uh, on his waistcoat and was pointed at and giggled at by children in the street, but he rather loved children and was very fond of them. Uh, uh, at one point, uh, his music became very unfashionable. Yeah, he, wrote, he wrote a huge number of operas, which now uh, are much venerated and are exceptionally beautiful. But um, uh, popular music uh, of another kind took over, particularly the beggar's opera, and he became very unfashionable, and the orchestra that he had funded uh, was bust, and he had no money. Uh, and he had one chance. Someone said, take an oratorio, um, and perform it in Dublin. It's going to do good uh, for, uh, for the new governor general of Dublin, <coughs> Duke of Devonshire, and uh, he'd love you to do it. And uh, he chose the subject of the Messiah. Um, and at the same time, Thomas Coram had founded this hospital for poor children in London. Uh, in London at that time, if you were a child of the parish, seven out of ten died before they were three years old. Children were left on parish doorsteps, and as I say, seven out of ten of them died. And Thomas, Thomas Coram thought something should be done about it, so he tried to raise funds to build a hospital. He got three great artists. Um, he, he got uh, Joshua Reynolds, uh, and, and he got Hogarth, and he got Handel. Terribly excited by the idea. And Handel, who was dirt broke, produced this masterpiece, The Messiah. has such an extraordinary moment on it. You all know it, of course, the Alleluia Chorus. The story goes that when the king first heard it, he leapt to his feet. Tradition of this day, everybody stands up when they hear the Hallelujah Chorus. Handel donated every single penny that came from The Messiah to the hospital. He didn't take any money for it. He was just a huge-hearted man. And you listen to his music, and you hear it. It calls across the centuries. It connects you to some of the most extraordinary figures, as I say, who have ever lived. And I will end by just explaining, as if it is a technical term that somehow should terrify people, one particular element of, of music, um, which is called the concerto. Now, as you probably know, a concerto is usually a piece of music which figures a single instrument uh, and a whole orchestra. Now, it's an odd and a sad thing the people aren't taught anymore how to listen. In a world where much comes at us at huge speed, we've all talked about it, we've all laughed about the fact that we live in a digital age where everything's fast, it means we set an even higher price on things that are slow and that are complex and beguiling and seductively difficult and take just a little bit of time to get to know, rather in the same way that a cheap prostitute is never quite as beautiful as, say, a French woman with much less makeup. You may get a very quick stiffy from a prostitute, but you get love from beauty. And a concerto... <laughs> so I, I'll just leave you this because I would actually love you to go home and listen to any concerto along these lines. It can be a famous one like, uh, you know, Beethoven's Fifth, the Emperor Concerto. It can be uh, Tchaikovsky's First Piano Concerto. It can be, it can be, it can be a, a violin concerto, a cello concerto, whatever you please. Uh, you don't have to listen to it like this, but it always works, and, and, it, and it blows your mind. A concerto is an argument between an individual and the state, between an individual and society. It is an individual voice crying out 
and trying to make a statement of some kind, and it's often drowned out by the orchestra, and it fights back. And the orchestra fights back, and it fights back. And the dynamic of listening to that is like nothing on earth. And are we really saying that youth, by which we don't mean you, of course, we mean the kids, the pikey, hoodie, chavvy people, whom we will never know, but whom we presume to know how to feed, and whom we presume to know what's good for them. They don't deserve to hear that. They don't deserve to hear the highest calling that we can have, which is love and hope and triumph and magnificence. And all those things are apparent in that music. And if you haven't got the imagination to blow the dust off the wings, then you don't deserve any kind of music. You don't deserve, certainly, to be at the finest university in the world. Mm. I beg leave to oppose the motion. Thank you very much. But in this case, there's no problem, because classical music is irrelevant to youth today. Any living art form is always growing and developing, building on the past, but forging ahead to capture the essence of today and even of tomorrow. An art form that doesn't grow is dead. Once upon a time, classical music was alive. It captured emotions, and it even, as Stephen has said, inspired revolutions. But today, it's dead. Classical music doesn't develop. It has nothing new to say. If anyone has ever had to sit through the sheer agony of so-called modern music, they'll know exactly <coughs> what it's like. Classical music inhabits an artistic mausoleum, and youth and mausoleums don't go together. Because classical music has no present and no future, what is there left to do but to continuously perform the triumphs of the past? A classical concert is the artistic equivalent of newly painted glowing copies of Rembrandt, or Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, or pastiche architecture. All very nice, but hardly creative. And nobody in their right minds would call that stuff relevant. <laughs> the moribund decadence of classical music reaches its high point in opera. An art form of such little substance <laughs> that opera companies compete with each other compete with each other by means of more and more elaborate <coughs> and expensive productions. The music is secondary and they know it. I give way. Well, you're the, you're the to the marriage figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. do you have you watched how opera companies present it? They care about not the music, the production. That's all the reviewers talk about. On that point. <laughs> 
motion is classical music is irrelevant, not opera companies and their misdemeanors are irrelevant to today's <laughs> Does anyone, apart from a few masochists, actually enjoy opera? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, at the Royal Opera House, where I used to sit on the board, <laughs> 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 and have you noticed the royal box at the opera house? It's artfully placed so that when you're in the box, you can't see the stage. <laughs> but everyone can see you. <laughs> A metaphor for the value of classical music, if ever there was one. <coughs> so who does listen to classical music? Well, the old are not unfamiliar with mausoleums. And if they and young fogies... Uh, want to doze over endless repetition of familiar tunes, then that's up to them. But unfortunately, unfortunately, classical music isn't harmless because it's used as a means of self-identification by the selfish middle classes. Classical music shamelessly absorbs huge sums of public and private philanthropy, starving living art forms. There are at least seven subsidized symphony orchestras in London. Seven. To what end? Tonight, the result of this debate can send out a clear message that the Cambridge Union is in favor of creativity and progress, that the Cambridge Union supports living art forms and rejects the snobbish conspiracy of classical music. Support progress, support the motion. <laughs>
whole scentic cycle. And great classical music has an extra ingredient, the mysterious relationship of music to the soul, a relationship beyond simple logic. Of course there is great jazz, there is great folk, there is great rock, and there's crap classical music. But by not accessing great classical music, young people miss out on a great mine of human experience and emotion. It may at times be difficult to unearth, but the effort yields transformative results and rewards. For that mine contains pure gold. So why are there no queues of young people around the block for stunning concerts given by increasing flow of magnificent young classical musicians? Too many of the world of classical music have fallen for the arguments of the dumbers down and retreated into their own safe and smug enclosure. And in doing so, they connive with the X Factor crowd. So it's not classical music that's irrelevant to today's youth. It's the stuffy pretension that surrounds so much performance that is irrelevant. That is what has to change. By voting against this motion, you can help make the change. You can strike a blow for classical freedom. Reject the motion. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 